I'm Sylvia Yunt, and I'm so pleased to welcome you here today for this very special program focused on the Samuel Morse painting, the iconic painting that we're so privileged to have here, um, the Gallery of the Louvre that's on gracious loan from the Terra Foundation for American Art. Boy, this is so high, this mic. I think I'm going to move this. Excuse me, I can't see any of you. Um, the Terra Foundation in Chicago, which has, uh, as you may know, has um, closed its museum in Chicago, still has a museum outside of Paris, but this painting, which has been the mainstay of their collection for so many years, was recently featured at the Louvre in an exhibition that was curated, co-curated by one of our speakers today, and you'll be hearing more about that. Uh, but we are so grateful to the Foundation for the long-term loan of this painting. It will be here at the High, um, David, for a year, uh, for the course of the, the paintings component of the Louvre exhibition, which I hope you've all had a chance to see. Um, I also want to recognize the Foundation for their very generous funding of this particular program. Um, the Terra Foundation is very focused on encouraging dialogues, international dialogues about American art, cross-cultural uh, fertilization, and exchange of scholars, and I think this, this program aptly represents that on so many different levels. Um, I wanted to also let you know that our speakers today have traveled from far and wide, and I will be introducing um, each of them individually, but just wanted to give you a bit of a sense of what's going to happen today. Our first speaker will be Paul Stady, then we will have Jean-Philippe Antoine speak, then there'll be a break, and then we will have a panel discussion with some other uh, invited guests that will be, uh, oh, I'm sorry, then... Olivia Mele, excuse me, and then we'll have a panel discussion in the afternoon, and at that point we'll have a dialogue among the speakers and then open it up to the audience, so I hope we can have um, some good discussion and questions. I am particularly pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Paul Stady, who is a professor of art history at Mount Holyoke College in uh, New England, so he's come a bit, uh, traveled a bit to be with us today. I've actually been scheming to get Paul here for probably about four years, uh, ever since we acquired, ever since the High acquired a wonderful portrait uh, by Samuel Morris that many of you may know. It's hanging in the Richard Meyer building, a portrait of his, the artist's wife and children, which had been on long-term loan to the High for about 15, 20 years um, through descendants of the Morse family, which happened to live in Atlanta. There's a very rich uh, Morse dialogue uh, in this city and uh, in the South, actually. And um, the painting finally entered the collection a few years ago, and I had always hoped that we could get Paul here to speak about Morse in general. Um, Paul is the reigning Morse expert and scholar. He wrote his dissertation on Samuel F. B. Morse at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm pleased that we share that uh, alma mater. Um, he has been working recently on Gilbert Stewart's presidential portraits, but you may also know his work on John Singleton Copley. He really, I think you could say, changed the whole focus of uh, interpretive approach, the whole interpretive approach to Copley and the wonderful essay he wrote for the major Copley retrospective organized by the Metropolitan Museum many years ago. So he is a, a major scholar of 18th century portraiture in particular. And today he is going to be speaking about um, Morse and American artists, the generation of American artists who traveled to Paris in the 1830s and who were very politically aware. He participated in the Louvre exhibition uh, this past summer, the American artists at the Louvre, and wrote a wonderful essay for that catalog. And I believe we carry that catalog now in our gift shop. It's called American Artists and the Louvre at the Louvre, and I hope you'll all um, take a look at it afterwards. So without further ado, Paul Stady. Good morning. I want to thank um, everyone at the High Museum and the Terra Foundation and naturally the Louvre for making all of this possible. Um, perhaps we could have the lights down. After the brief but earth-shaking July Revolution of 1830, and you're looking at um, a print from that, this is City Hall in Paris, over here. Uh, after that revolution, which was centered in the city of Paris, a number of American artists, uh, the painter Samuel F. B. Morse and Thomas Cole, the sculptor Horatio Greeno, and their literary friends, the novelist James Fenimore Cooper, 
and the journalist Nathaniel P. Willis came to the capital of Europe with high hopes of studying old master painting and contemporary architecture, and perhaps acquiring uh, a commission for a work of art, and ultimately returning home to fulfill what they believed was the cultural promise of America. Each one of these men keenly felt and expressed, to be sure, his Americanness. But as much as Paris was an opportunity for Americans to be American, it also led them to unexpected cultural and political encounters with the unnerving, post-revolutionary, pre-Republican ethos of the new Europe. They obsessively compared American art, culture, and institutions to their French counterparts, and whether that led to feelings of superiority, inferiority, concordance, or indifference, it certainly unavoidably caused them to rethink their own new world identities. Paris had the power to unlock and amplify, rather than inhibit and silence, the tastes and opinions of the Americans. And for Morse, who is among the most engaged and passionate of pilgrims to that city, it dislodged his religiosity, his republicanism, his prudery, his nationalism, and his xenophobia, just to name a few of the roiling inner forces shaping his adventures in France. His audacious and epic gallery of the Louvre, painted in 1832 and 33, was the climactic visual statement of that experience. Let me try to sketch this in for you so that you understand this picture in a cultural way. Morse had entered Paris <coughs> on the 12th of September of 1831, and together with his best friend Cooper, he got involved in the heady post-revolutionary politics of the city. A traitor king has been driven into exile, wrote Morse in his diary. Blood has flowed in its streets the price of its liberty. Morse and Cooper imagine that they were not only first-hand witnesses to the republicanization of Europe, but that they were actual agents of political change. They monitored and debated the popular uprisings in Poland, Belgium, Parma, Modena, and Bologna, and persuaded themselves that they represented the possibilities for the future of France and Europe simply by being Americans in Paris. Collectively, the Americans also came to understand that the new citizen king, Louis Philippe, was not going to follow through on the promise of the July Revolution. The Americans eventually saw hope decline into riots in the streets, limits imposed on human rights, and eventually the eclipse of their hero, who was Lafayette. Surely Morse's interest and involvement in the affairs of the July monarchy, as it was called, had everything to do with American nationalism. That is, the sustained belief that America was on to something special, that the United States had already gotten it right, and that the American political model was a good one for every nation. His public bragging about the United States led predictably to charges of chauvinism and his relentless impulse to compare America to France and then differentiate and distance America from France was as powerful as his wish to see the popular movements succeed. This complex dynamic of identification and separation was evident in all the Americans. Cole would actually visualize the American fascination with and critique of Europe in his, in his epic, The Course of Empire, which he began painting shortly after his return to America in 1832. In the sequence of five pictures, which chart the rise and fall of an imaginary European civilization, Cole proposed that monarchy, aristocracy, and luxury, if left unchecked, led to endless war, sure decline, and ultimate desolation. You're looking at pictures number three and four in the cycle. Here is consummation, a kind of glorious uh, a antique um, um, uh, uh, utopia here, but uh, of such excess that it's naturally going to lead to destruction over here where um, uh, it, it, it decays from within and then eventually from without. 
Though, to be sure, all the Americans in France harbor doubts about the future direction of their own country, especially under the presidency of Andrew Jackson. They were capable of convincing themselves in Paris that exceptional American individuals, national institutions, and natural advantages would protect America from despotism and deliver it instead to its inevitable greatness. For that process to take hold, however, contemporary France, because of its intellectual turmoil, because of its so-called dangerous Catholic beliefs, and because of its monarchical past, could not be America's model, however tempting so many other aspects of its culture might be. Driven by their belief in American destiny and the related quest for American self-sufficiency in the arts, they looked at everything abroad through their own nationalistic lenses. For this entire generation of American visitors to Paris, being critical of France was part of becoming American. The one aspect of Parisian art that was most compelling and least threatening to the Americans living in France after 1830 was the old master paintings in the Louvre. To the Americans, it was the high water mark of European civilization. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on in this paper. But what about recent French painting? What about contemporary French art? It, certainly, it was in abundance at the Louvre, at the Luxembourg Palace, and at the annual Salon. And the Americans felt nothing but contempt for all of it. Greeno turned sour as he considered modern French painting. Indeed, Jacques-Louis David's pictures at the Louvre, presumably including the Oath of the Horatii, which you see here, seemed so cold to him that in, his, in a letter he said he felt the want of a great coat and a cigar in looking at them. Though he did not specify the other modern French artists caught in his critical lens, Greeno considered all of them clever men employed in twiddle-twaddle, caricature, indecent pictures, etc. And Thomas Cole said that, I had been informed that modern painting was very low in point of merit in Paris, but I had not expected to see so many vile productions with so few good ones, I was disgusted. All the subjects are bloody or voluptuous, death, murder, battle. It's not known whether any of the Americans attended the salons of 1831 or 1832, but certainly the 3,000 or so works of art on display at each exhibition could hardly escape their notice. The galleries were full of portraits that legitimized the rule of Louis Philippe and pictures that dramatized the intense street fighting during the July Revolution. But tellingly, the most famous and certainly the most enthralling of the pictures in the 1831 salon, Eugène Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, was never mentioned in any of the Americans' letters or diaries. And in fact, almost none of the most prominent French artists of the day, Delacroix, Delaroche, Vernet, Girard, are ever cited uh, in any form by them. So why such a wholesale rejection? To be sure, it had something to do with the Americans' residual British taste. Uh, pictures such as Delacroix's Death of Sardanapalus looked too histrionic to them. But more specifically, the dismissal of contemporary French art was a byproduct of American cultural politics in Paris. Greeno, Morris, and Cooper needed to see the arts in France heading in the wrong direction because they were adamant in seeing um, um, uh, arts in America heading in the right direction. They believed in a prospective vision of the rising glory and future triumph of American arts, even though they would soon discover upon their return back to America that there was little evidence for it. They thought they already had the perfect political system. And in that delirious state of manifest destiny that Paris awakened in them, they came to believe that the American arts, too, would eclipse European arts. 
It was the philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was in Paris in 1833, who expressed it best. He had a deep appreciation of and respect for European culture. But at the same time, he too understood that there was a pressing need for America to detach itself from its European paternity if the nation's thinking and values were to ever become unique and vigorous. Writing on this theme in his famous speech of 1837, the American scholar, Emerson feared that America already was becoming, in his words, timid, timid, imitative, tame. Emerson went on to say that if it were ever to be its own country, then it cannot continue to be, again in Emerson's words, to be fed on the sere remains of foreign harvests. Echoing Morse and Morse's friends, Emerson concisely warned Americans in this, in this famous quotation, we have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. Yet as much as the Americans disparaged contemporary French art, they revered the old masters. This is a picture by Veronese that's in the Louvre. Um, and it was the old masters, that was what Cole was expecting to see when he walked toward the museum in May of 1831. But upon his arrival, he said, I was painfully disappointed to find that the works of the old masters were covered by the production of mod productions of modern painting. But it was Morris who was perhaps most fully engaged with the Louvre. He had formulated a plan as early as 1830, when he stopped briefly in Paris on his way to Italy, to paint a picture of reduced, reduced versions of the best of the old master collection, and to take that canvas back to New York as a potent instrument for American cultural education. As president of the National Academy of Design in New York, Morse had already taken personal responsibility for arranging America's cultural future. But if you wanted to accomplish this goal of encouraging American artists and an American audience for American art, he had to show that it was what it was that constituted excellence in the visual arts. But how could that be done when there were so few models of excellence in the United States? There were very few old master paintings in America. Most Americans were very unlikely to travel abroad to see the originals. And when European originals were copied for the American market, the results, well, unlike the easy reproduction of European novels, in European poetry, the reproduction of European art usually was substandard or downright frightful. Morse, like Emerson, did not want to see America merely imitating Europe. But as an American making an American picture of great European pictures, Morse would be able to personally select and import, if that's the right word, import accurate and in fact erudite uh, reproductions. And in doing so, he thought he could broker the sizable cultural gap between Europe and America without turning the United States into a provincial outpost of Europe. As his thinking went, if he were successful, he could push his young nation toward eventual parity with the old world on America's own terms. For his fellow American students and citizens, Morse thus envisioned his gallery of the Louvre as a portal to personal enlightenment and national improvement. Well, Morse must have been crestfallen to discover in September of 1831, when he returned to Paris to begin work on his picture of the Gallery of the Louvre, that the walls of the Salon Carré, historically the gallery devoted to the best of the collection, that 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 those walls were covered with contemporary French art, most prominently with Jericho's Raft of the Medusa. That forced Morris to develop a more complex way of doing what he wanted to do. And what I have here on the screen is a little comparison of the Salon Carré as Morris paints it in, um, 
his uh, gallery of the Louvre. And as that same gallery uh, looks today, um, which is no longer a gallery of, amassed, uh, of, of masterpieces from the Louvre. Um, the, the Louvre is looking fabulous, though I, I think the Salon Carré has lost a little something um, over the years. What Morse had to do was basically walk down and through the Grand Galerie uh, where the pictures he wanted were hanging, and he had to uh, do his work uh, in there. Uh, as befits an ac academician, which he was, he set for himself the difficult task of trying to approximate the style of 28 different painters as represented in 38 pictures, five national schools, Italy, Holland, Spain, Flanders, France, and three centuries, although all but two of the pictures are from the 16th and 17th centuries. With a sense of taste that reflected all the Americans, Morris copied works by Leonardo, Titian, Rubens, Rembrandt, Raphael, Poussin, Van Dyck, Correggio, Veronese, and 19 other artists. He worked on his picture of pictures for about a year, from the autumn of 1831 through the cholera ep epidemic of 1832 to September of the same year, and maintained a punishing schedule, as he wrote in his diary, all day from eight till dark, with time off only for eat and sleep. Alexander von Humboldt, the naturalist, came to watch Morse work in the Louvre, as did Cooper, who walked to the museum each day to see Morris, as Cooper explained it, stuck up on a high walking stand, copying. Crowds get round the picture, for Samuel has made quite a hit at the Louvre. Even the self-effacing Morris had to admit that it is, in his own words, a splendid and valuable work. It excites great a deal of attention from strangers and the French artists. I have many compliments on it, and I am sure it is the most correct one of its kind ever painted for everyone says I have caught the style of each of the old masters. Back in New York, in, uh, uh, late in 1832, he continued work on the walls of the Salon and, and, and added the figures and finished the picture in August of 1833. In the center foreground, he painted himself and, let's see, I think I have a detail, right? He painted himself. Uh, appropriately instructing a young student. While in the far left corner, uh, you'll see James Fenimore Cooper discussing the picture with his wife and his daughter. The Gallery of the Louvre culminated the voyage of the Americans to Paris in the wake of the July Revolution. By Morse's calculation, the exhibition of the picture in New York was meant to set in motion a chain of cultural epiphanies that would shepherd America toward its destiny as the next great civilization. Greeno had once imagined the intoxication of that moment when Greeno wrote, in the year 1833, S.F.B. Morris and H. Greeno will be in the city of New York, decidedly the merriest and best fellows in the place. But the disastrous public showing of the Gallery of the Louvre during October and November of 1833 jolted Morse and the artists in his circle. William Dunlap, uh, an artist and historian of the period, observed that every artist and connoisseur was charmed with it, but it was caviar to the multitude. Receipts from admissions did not even pay the rent on the gallery space. Morse cut off the exhibition prematurely, sold the picture cheap, brooded then about what he called a paralysis of spirit, and he began, in his words, to stifle all aspiring thoughts. What had gone wrong? I think it had something to do with the whole idea of a large picture of miniaturized old master pictures, which was a type of painting that had no precedent in America, and in fact, that had so little narrative interest that it could not hold or even draw in casual viewers. But most fatally, I think, that Morris had grossly miscalculated the interest of the American public in becoming art literate, or at all invested in an Americanized abridgment of their European paternity. 
the debacle of the exhibition led Morris to realize that his vision of America's cultural triumph was a dream. His former euphoria about America turned into a lament. He wrote, there's a great deal to dishearten in the state of feeling, or rather the state of no feeling, on the arts in that city, that city being New York. He complained to various correspondents that in New York, again in his words, everyone here is driving after money, as usual. Commerce, commerce, commerce is the only thought and occupation of this great, enterprising, thriving people. Here, boorishness and ill manners are preferred to polish and refinement. Morse was crushed by the rejection of the picture and of the entire agenda he had formulated in Paris, and he confessed, my life of poetry and romance is gone. Within four years, he would stop painting forever and end his career as an artist and move on to his more successful, and I'd have to say lucrative, experiments with the electromagnetic telegraph. All along, of course, underneath the American's hyperbolic posturing in France, there was a deep-seated fear that the arts in America were going nowhere, and that failure was as imminent as triumph. Morse could suppress those thoughts in Paris, but when he returned to the United States in 1832, he came face to face with reality. He came to think of King Andrew Jackson as offensive and as corrupt as King Louis Philippe, and became convinced that America was inexorably moving toward vulgarity, ignorance, and demagoguery, and not enlightenment. The returning Americans, poor guys, um, might have averted or deflected their collision course with the United States, or at least avoided their colossal disappointment had they been able to speak with Alexis de Tocqueville and his fellow traveler, Gustave de Beaumont. Those two Frenchmen toured America from, America from May 1831 to February 1832 with the stated goal of studying and filing a report on the American penal system but unofficially, they were motivated to travel by their distaste for the political dishonesty of the July monarchy. As critical witnesses to America, they scouted out the political and economic possibilities for France, and they found democracy, public spirit, manufacturers, institutional efficiency. And also, they identified all the social disadvantages of America that Morris and Cooper would soon lament materialism, ordinariness, philistinism, the tyranny of the majority, and individualism. The perceptive Tocqueville even had insight into the experiences that Morris and his cohort was having in Paris at the same time when Tocqueville observed, the American leaves his country with a heart swollen with pride. He arrives in Europe and immediately notices that people there are not as preoccupied as he imagined with the United States and the great people that inhabits it. He begins to feel annoyed. Had Tocqueville, Beaumont, Cooper, and Morse met, they might have detected the similarities between their projects abroad. All four were sifting through their host culture in an effort to bring back those aspects that would advance their home civilization, at least they imagined as it should be. To be sure, Tocqueville and Beaumont published more of their observations than their American counterparts did, but Cooper and Morse's experiences were just as rich and complex. In fact, Cooper and Morse produced parallels to Tocqueville's two books, Democracy in America and the Penitentiary System in the United States and its Application in France, which I don't re recommend that you read. For we might say that Morse's Gallery of the Louvre was in effect a visual essay on the artistic patrimony of France and its application to the United States. And Cooper's political and fiction writings together amounted to a brutal account of despotism in France. All four men were elite, recondite, dogged, opinionated, and astute. And as they traveled in different directions at the same time, all four carried around intellectual baggage containing a visible wardrobe of national interests, proclivities, and aspirations. Of course, they would never cross paths, but they were nonetheless linked 
by their obsessively comparative critiques of their respective host countries that in the end had the function of sharpening their definitions of themselves as Americans and as Frenchmen. Given their catastrophic return to the United States, the time the Americans spent in Paris after the July Revolution might be seen as a fleeting moment in which doubt was suspended and dreams of the future were freely formed. Instead of despairing about America while they were abroad, they instead asked themselves what needed to be done if there were ever going to be something that could seriously be called a great American art. Morris could temporarily put aside any latent anxiety over that question and adopt instead a boastful nationalistic language of success and quick censure of foreign art and cultures. He could boldly take responsibility for being America's cultural redeemer, euphorically singing the praises of a rising golden age, and even produce an audacious instrument for cultural transformation in the shape of the Gallery of the Louvre. But in the end, in this desperate struggle to design a cultured America where the fine arts might reign, Morse failed, betrayed by his own dreamy Parisian visions. Looking back now, long after it was all over, the Gallery of the Louvre takes on the dimensions of a quixotic venture and the vaunted expectations he formulated for America's cultural ascendancy while living in France seem both lush and arrogant, heroic and impossible, a brief journey into hubris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. As you see, uh, there's so much more than meets the eye when it comes to this painting, a very problematic and ultimately poignant picture. Um, I also just wanted to mention that, of course, the, the Morse picture in, in so many ways symbolizes the ongoing Franco-American conversation that has shaped art appreciation and uh, practice, really, education in this country and in France. I mean, it is a two-way street, and you certainly see that from the beginning of um, this period we're talking about the 1830s, but up to the present day, and I would argue, indeed, it shapes the current relationship that we have here in Atlanta, between Louvre Atlanta, and that, that uh, ongoing desire to learn and, and share uh, from each other. Um, I'm also, I wanted to, uh, again, mention the Terra Foundation and, and their support of this program and their ongoing interest in encouraging this kind of conversation between European and American scholars, and today we're certainly uh, pushing that forward a bit more, and we're so pleased to have with us Jean-Philippe Antoine, who is currently living in the States. He's in Washington, D.C. as a senior fellow at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and um, has come up for the weekend to spend with us. In his day job, though, he teaches um, aesthetics in the philosophy department at the University of Lyon in France and has a special interest in the relationship between images and the social construction of memory. And I think you'll see in his talk, this, this certainly plays out in the Morse picture as well, what has been termed the Louvre effect and the, the whole sense of memory that has shaped um, artists' voyages and, and uh, learning from the Louvre, certainly. He has worked on the medieval art of memory and its relationship to early Renaissance Italian painting, again, something we can see in the, Louvre, in the Morris picture, as well as on contemporary German artists, which I was interested to see, um, particularly on Joseph Boyce and Gerhard Richter. Um, Richter, as you know, very well represented in the, in the Heys collection. And actually his book, his monograph on Boyce, is due to come out next year. His current project at the Smithsonian, though, uh, concerns the, the issue of uh, the modern definition of art and its place in the democratic societies of the 19th and 20th century, particularly in America, and that is indeed what has shaped his interest in Morse and in this picture and um, other works by him. And he'll speak to us today on, I love this title, of a class somewhat novel, Samuel Morse's House of Representatives and the Gallery in the Louvre. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the High Museum. I'm very, I feel very privileged to be with you today, and I also thank the 
Terra Foundation, uh, which allows me also to be uh, with you this morning. I also have to apologize for the very French accents with which this paper will be delivered and for the fact that I will read it. Um, <clears throat> our focus today is on the, the Gallery of the Louvre, uh, but I would like this morning to examine it with in conjunction with the artist's one previous attempt at history or exhibition painting. The house or hall of representatives executed 10 years uh, before. In both paintings, Morse tackled issues that his other works could not address directly. At the time they were first exhibited, both failed to validate their author's ambitions. The audience simply wasn't there for this kind of work, as Paul Stati very eloquently explained. But their failure to register immediately in the public mind points toward what makes them interesting for us today, for the tension between Morse's avowed ambitions as a history painter and the means he actually used ended up producing a very inventive result. Indeed, I would like to argue that these two paintings constitute a subgenre in itself, a subgenre that could not be recognized as such by the targeted audiences for reasons which I hope will be clear by the close of these remarks. In this new mode of thinking about history painting, archeological truth, as opposed to the expression of human passions and the morals it entails, fixes the main value of the work. Two paintings of Benjamin West, at first sight very different, each introduce this ideal. The first one, which is in front of you, is Agrippina landing at Brindisium with the ashes of Germanicus. It's from 1768. And while it invokes ancient models as well as 17th century painting, it also reproduces features typical of contemporary London theater stagings, thus offering the viewer a quasi-theatrical experience felt as such by contemporary spectators in combination with an effort to obtain archeological truth in the representation of locale and costumes. The second picture introduces a more recognizable uh, revolution in history painting. It is the famous death of General Wolfe from 1770, whose use of contemporary uniforms in the description of the death of a national hero caused a scandal and a consequent reevaluation of the manner and scope of the genre. In both paintings, the priority given by West to what he called the facts of the transaction implies the reorganization of the task of composing the picture. For if, to borrow Daniel Webb's words in 1761, history painting is the representation of a momentary drama, then the momentariness of the drama will take precedence over any other consideration. As a consequence, says Webb, we may, in treating of compositions, borrow our ideas from the stage and divide it into two parts, the scenery and the drama. The excellence of the first consists in a pleasing disposition of the figures that comprise the action. The distinction here introduced between scenery and drama sets the stage for the subsequent separation in painting. Indeed, what West and his successors borrowed from the stage was not necessarily drama, but lighting and disposition. In a number of works, the turn towards the representation of a momentary drama actually implies the suppression of drama as such. The dramatic dimension is now taken care of by the pretense on the part of the picture to procure its spectator with the illusory feeling of being there, wherever and whenever this where may be. A fine example of this logic is given by John Trumbull's Declaration of Independence from 1818. What do we see in this painting? 
A man seated at a desk receives papers presented to him by a group of five individuals. He is watched by a few dozen other individuals, most of them sitting in rows, a few other left standing. We all know here that the seated man is George Washington. The one presenting him with the papers is Thomas Jefferson. We'll not try to identify all the others. A key to the picture enabled one to do so when it was first exhibited. The visual lack of drama exhibited by the picture in respect to contemporary standards and Trumbull's insistence on likeness in portraiture all declare that what is being offered to the eye of the beholder is, or rather claims to be, the pictorial record of an event as opposed to its ideal recreation. In the interval between West's first efforts and Trumbull's spectacularly unspectacular achievement, the topical mode of address had been thoroughly developed and extended in panorama painting, a second and less explicit factor in Morse's endeavor. Panorama painting's importance lies first in the independent development it gave to the scenery of history painting. Because of historical and geographical accuracy, and also because of the reality effect of representation pushed towards the limits of hallucination, freeing the painter from the obligation of necessarily displaying spectacular gesture, it concentrated the attention on the recording of the place and time of the event under consideration. Second, panorama painting created new expectations, or rather, a new lack of expectations in its address to spectators. The leitmotif in the criticism of panoramas, often invoked in positive manner, is that as opposed to history painting, its enjoyment did not require any previous education in the fine arts, thus making it an eminently democratic form of entertainment. Indeed, for a number of history painters, including such luminaries as Reynolds, West, or Trumbull, the very porosity between pictorial journalism and panoramas entertained a promise. Their success would familiarize a general audience with the higher branches of art, and thus paved the way for the restoration of the most elevated form of history of painting, away from its aristocratic cradle and at home in its new democratic context. To summarize this point, I will quote the remark of John van der Leen, one of the foremost American historical painters of his generation, trained in Paris by the pupil of David and author of a panorama of Versailles, which was shown in New York starting in June 1819. This is Vanderlyn. Panoramic exhibitions possess so much of the magic deceptions of art as irresistibly to captivate all classes of spectators which give them a decided advantage over every other description of pictures. For no study or cultivated taste is required fully to appreciate the merits of such representations. They have the further power of conveying much practical and topographical information, such as can in no other way be supplied except by actually visiting the scenes which they represent and if instruction and mental gratification be the aim of painting, no class of pictures have a fairer claim to the public estimation than panoramas. As a matter of fact, in practice, the distinction between panoramas and historical exhibition paintings was often blurred. In van der Leyen's Rotunda, for instance, visitors of the panoramas could also contemplate his Caius Marius on the ruins of Carthage, and other related historical efforts, such as his Ariadne. More than the technicalities of panorama paintings as such, what mattered in this type of exhibition was the size and the topicality of the images displayed. I would like to argue that Morse's efforts in his two single attempts at big size historical paintings partake of this panoramic logic. I would call them, so to speak, miniature panoramas. I would also like to argue that the subjects they actually depicted 
as opposed to what they claim to represent, rendered them at the time almost invisible to the great majority of their intended audience. The first sign of the deployment of this panoramic logic is the insistence on what van der Leyen had called the practical and topographical information. Washington's National Intelligencer, probably cued by Morse, declared the subject of this painting to be, quote, an interior view of the House of Representatives chamber in the Capitol at the time of candle lighting, whilst the great chandelier is suspended in the center of the chamber. And in the key that he wrote for the public exhibition of the picture, Morse himself insisted that, quote, the primary design of the present picture is not so much to give highly finished likenesses of the individuals introduced as to exhibit to the public a faithful representation of the National Hall with its furniture and business during the session of Congress. As with the later Gallery of the Louvre, the emphasis here is on the accurate visual description of the place, including its furniture and business. The second sign of this panoramic logic is the size of the paintings, as well as the insistence on the rendering of the lighting conditions. Finally, Versailles, the Capitol, and the Louvre are all sites of historical interest and places of import in the definition of emerging democratic societies because of the relationship they instigate between art and a new kind of public. But I will here leave aside the verbal presentation of the works, for it is their visual construction that makes the strongest case for their panoramic structure. And I would like to discuss now a few features of John van der Leyen's Panorama of Versailles, one of the rare examples still extant of American panoramas, but also, I believe, one most directly borrowed from in his own endeavors. The first of these features entails less a question of size than one of scale. The House of Representatives exhibits a striking difference between its faraway view, when the architectural character of the picture predominates by far, and a close-up examination which transforms the tiny groups of figures perceived at first into recognizable likenesses of all the individuals present, from speaker to male clerks. If you look at Van der Leyen's slightly earlier Versailles panorama, we will find two similar levels of entry into the picture. Seen from afar, the painted panels deliver an architectural image of the palace and gardens with their many statues and, to quote Van der Leyen's advertisement in the American in 1820, the motions of the gay groups that glide among them. Moving closer, though, one discovers individual faces and figures the tiny figures of King Louis XVIII and his court on the central balcony, those of the officers of the Allied Occupation Force assembled at Versailles in 1814-1815, and also, last but not least, ordinary dwellers enjoying a stroll in the park. The first two series of, two series of figures declare the topicality of the picture without linking it to a specifically timed event. The third entails a form of time shaped by the activities displayed, strolling, playing, conversing, enjoying the views, as well as by the seasonal hour. It is both specific in terms of the light conditions and atmosphere, and generic inasmuch as it is a repressible circumstance, any bright afternoon in the fall season. Indeterminacy is a key word here. None of the activities described possess a pre-assigned specific beginning or end, nor do the movements of the strollers display any pre-ordering patterns. Van der Leyen's description is that of a perfectly ordinary moment, whose momentariness, as described here, may be enjoyed by just about anybody. The House of Representatives displays very similar strategies. While insisting on the necessity for each figure to be recognizable by their acquaintance as likenesses, Morse refuses to produce 
any highly finished likeness. To do so, he used the same tools employed by Vanderlyn in his panoramas, a brush too large to enable one to produce the fine strokes associated to the highly fin finished history paintings, while subtle enough to maintain the possibility of painting individual portraits. Other features of both the House of Representatives and the Gallery of the Louvre harken back to this type of panoramic views. One is their insistence on prospectival space as the foundation for archaeolog archaeological truth in the picture. We know that Morse, even though he had a reasonably good training and was a gifted draftsman, struggled for several weeks with the rendering of the hall's perspective, finally sending for a camera obscura to help with the laying out on canvas of the architecture. There was no reason for this unless the kind of exactitude he aimed for was that of panoramic views. A further indication of this relationship resides in the point of view adopted. Posited slightly higher than the ground of the room displayed, it allows the viewer to peer down into the space. In the house, this is hardly noticeable since it more or less corresponds with the viewer's natural placing inside the upper promenade. It is more awkward in the case of the Gallery of the Louvre, where no architectural element in the room may account for the slightly downward perspective but it corresponds to an established practice in the setting of panoramic views. Another feature of the gallery reinforces this, the cutting of the high walls just above the picture zone, below the ceiling and any readily identifiable source of light. In both cases, the horizontal strip that the viewer of the painting is invited to contemplate displays the type of view that can be taken at once in panorama. For contrast, we may take a look at another strictly contemporary and more painterly view of the same room by the French painter Maillot. As much as any American painter of his generation, Morse was aware of the potential of panoramas, both as a way to make the kind of money that will allow him to indulge in history painting, and as a tool to educate what he called the generality of visitors. But the spectacular form of painting he consciously adopted is here put to a very peculiar task, one that was picked up but by few of its contemporary viewers. The New York Review and Athenaeum magazine in December 1825 praised the way the figures were distributed throughout the composition. And in November 1828, the National Intelligencer, decidedly favorable, quoted Charles Leslie's appreciation of, quote, the perfectly natural manner in which the figures have been grouped. That this perfectly natural manner was anything but natural is demonstrated in the adverse criticism also received by the painting of being, quote, too comprehensive and complicated for a picture. The perfectly natural manner praised by Leslie, who by the way was both a painter and a friend of Morse, actually embodies a new kind of order. Protected under the vast sublime space of a public democratic institution, individuals go about their peaceful activities singly or in groups, distributed throughout the lower end of the picture Representatives, visitors, male clerks are all mixed together in the same warm, luminous space. While the placement of some individuals or groups potentially alludes to their quality, for instance, uh, here, the group of Supreme Court judges near the frame print of the Constitution, this placement does not declare who or what they are. Indeed, there cannot be but some irony, conscious or not, in the placement of Philip P. Barber, the Speaker of the House, under the Speaker's desk, in contrast with the highest placed individual in the room, the doorkeeper of the House, on top of his ladder, busy lighting the imposing argon chandelier for the upcoming night session. 
just at the random promenades of the strollers in Van der Linde's panorama are made possible by the public use of the restored Versailles Palace and Gardens, the dehierarchized scattered groupings in the House of Representatives are a function of the institutional space which allows them to exist. In this sense, the random quality of the groupings fabricated by Morse is the perfectly natural manner of a specifically democratic public space. But these groupings are also a function of the type of activities this space allows. All of them are linked to communication. Preeminently represented here, as in Van der Linde's panorama, by the way, is conversation, either between two individuals or among larger groups. Then follows reading, either of a speech or of a book or of letters or journals. And finally, writing, writing letters or writing numbers. This is the inkstand of the speaker. It is also interesting to note that aside from the doorkeeper, the only employee's portrait are the mail clerks who take care of the receiving end of distant communication processes. In his book, Communication as Culture, James Carey remarked that the activities we collectively call communication, having conversations, giving instructions, imparting knowledge, sharing significant ideas, seeking information, entertaining and being entertained are so ordinary and mundane that it is difficult for them to arrest our attention. Maybe it is this very ordinariness that made and still makes difficult to recognize the exact nature of the subject of Moses' picture. Not just the great hall of representatives, nor the individuals who occupy his space, but the multiple activities of communication they indulge in, sanctioned by the new social and political space they belong to. The pregnancy of this subject, though, is demonstrated a second time 10 years later by the Gallery of the Louvre. In his second attempt at a large historical exhibition picture, Morse portrays one of the most typical emerging post-revolutionary democratic institutions, the museum in its then largest and most celebrated embodiment, the Louvre. He does it again by focusing on the most significant public places in the building, the Grand Gallery and Salon Carré, in which he places his own arrangement of paintings from the collection. A lot has been said, and very well this morning by Paul Stacey, about um, this bold gesture I will only concentrate now on the attitudes and activities of the figures occupying the space. Since, as in the House of Representatives, they implement the exchange, reproduction, and transmission of information. In the gallery and at the threshold of the salon, visitors gaze at the pictures displayed on the wall. In several cases, reading from guidebooks or catalogs. The difference in their costume and attitude from urban bourgeois to regional headdress indicates the open public nature of the space. In the salon itself, several conversations are in process. A couple reviews the work of a seated young copies. As you know, they are Fenimore Cooper, his wife, and their daughter. A young man gives advice to a young woman drawing and as you know, again, uh, the young man is Samuel Morse. But the activities of looking at pictures, reading, and conversing are here topped by the act of copying or reproducing, which is at the core of the picture, as well as of Morse's own endeavor in making it. As Paul Stati has told us, most of his time in Paris had been devoted to copying the pictures on the wall. And the Salon Carré in this painting has indeed become a copying studio. In a general sense, the Gallery of the Louvre can be seen as a specified application to the arts of the political pattern established in the House of Representatives. Visitors to the museum are gathered there for no other purpose than to look at pictures, to peruse 
visual or written information, to exchange judgments and opinions, and to acquire knowledge. But the gallery now implies something else, a new emphasis in the picture on the question of reproduction and its status as a tool for transmission gives it a very different accent. One especially significant, if we remember that it is on its way back from Paris in 1832 on board the package ship Surrey, with the nearly completed canvas of the gallery that more sketched the first diagrams of his telegraph and of the code associated with it. The revendication by Morse of the accuracy of his copies leads us in a new direction, or rather, it leads us towards two different, somewhat parallel paths. The first one just mentioned, and already mentioned by Paul earlier, is the telegraph, an instrument that helps to reproduce at a distance a pre-coded piece of information and allows for its speedy transmission. The other one is photography, whom Morse introduced to American audiences before becoming one of its first practitioners. And here is a daguerreotype by Morse. In the gallery of the Louvre, reproduction is still largely a matter of drawing and painting, and mechanical imitation maintains the time-honored meaning of detailed accuracy achieved by hand. But Morse's project of building a portable museum to the faithful and accurate reproduction of the masterworks of European painting and his project of achieving commercial success through the physical transportation of gathered visual information brings us very close to the thoughts underlying the building of the telegraph as well as to upcoming widespread uses of photography. Indeed, it brings us very close to issues we are still struggling with today. In his two miniature panoramas, most try to invent strategies that would allow the visual display of the relationship between democracy, communication, and art, a form of communication he felt particularly favorable to the democratic circulation of ideas. But at the same time, he tried to cling to absolute preconceptions about the nature of this art. His personal history reflects the progressive waning of his early ambitions first transferred to the telegraph and to photography before the final concentration on the telegraph, that is, on the transmission of information exclusively through the reproduction of pre-coded symbols. Paintings such as the House of Representatives and the Gallery of the Louvre show us that there existed ways to express these ambitions at a cost, though, that Morse was not fully ready to pay. To find a solid acceptance of the implicit strategies displayed in Morse's painting, we have to go to Europe 30 or 40 years later and look, for instance, at Courbet's gigantic Atelier du Peintre. But here I'm getting into a new chapter, a chapter that would be worthy of more consideration than I would be able to give it today without abusing even more your patience. So thank you. Thank you, Jean-Philippe, and I trust we'll be able to tease out some of these very provocative issues you've just raised, especially ending with Courbet. That could take that in many different directions. Um, I want to uh, second uh, Sylvia's thanks to the Terra Foundation uh, for making uh, this morning possible, and I very much enjoyed uh, both of the papers uh, this morning. Um, as an interesting aside, uh, we, as you know, have been working very closely with the Musée du Louvre, and I was just uh, at a workshop about the third year of our collaboration uh, two days ago, and I was seated next to uh, Jean-Philippe's sister, and I was just informed of that this morning. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful uh, small world, a wonderful collaboration um, that we're engaged in, that is the, uh, the High Museum and the Musée du Louvre. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Olivier Mele, who uh, is a good colleague and friend of mine. Um, we began the Louvre Atlanta project as co-curators, and since then, uh, Olivier has moved on to become the head 
of the Louvre Lens project, which is an antenna uh, outpost of the Louvre, which is being built in Lens in, in northern France. Um, so I see him uh, much less frequently than I used to, but we still uh, keep in touch and talk about the old times, right, Olivier? <laughs> Um, so Olivier, so it's wonderful to have Olivier uh, back and to have him again involved with, uh, uh, with Louvre Atlanta. Um, he is someone that I was made aware of many years ago. I uh, wrote my doctoral dissertation on Thomas Gainsborough, and I remember there was a, an exhibition of the early Gainsborough at the National Gallery of London, which then traveled to the Louvre. And one of the curators, uh, the, the curator of British art from the Louvre, who wrote on Gainsborough for this exhibition was Olivier Mellet. And I thought, who is this Olivier Mellet person? And uh, so I finally uh, got to meet him um, when we began uh, working together on this project. And he, is, uh, he was in charge of uh, not only um, uh, British paintings at the Louvre, but also American uh, and Spanish paintings. So he is the curator um, who worked with the Terra Foundation on the exhibition of American artists uh, in the Louvre, which uh, Sylvia mentioned. Uh, the catalog is, is available in our shop. And it's also uh, in that exhibition where we saw the painting, the Morse painting, uh, which was for a period of time last summer hung in the Salon Car Carré uh, of the Louvre. So we decided, Michael Shapiro and I decided when we saw the painting that it would make a really wonderful coda uh, to our first year um, exhibition. Um, Olivier, just to tell you a uh, number of things uh, about him, is, is married to uh, Laura de Marjorie, who is uh, a sculpture expert um, and someone that, in fact, I knew before I met uh, Olivier. Um, he is a, a graduate of the Sorbonne and also of the, um, uh, the Ecole du Louvre. He um, has worked at the Louvre for a number of years. Um, he recently uh, was the organizing curator of a very successful Hogarth uh, exhibition at the Louvre. And he also uh, instituted, um, I think thanks to the Terra Foundation, a project to catalog all of the American paintings uh, in, the, uh, in the national collections, in the French national collections. So I uh, asked him to come today as, as part of this um, wonderful uh, symposium around the painting uh, by Morse, but also to talk maybe a little bit more generally um, about the Louvre and its, um, I guess, relationship with American art um, and, and maybe some of the, the future of that uh, relationship. So, um, Olivier uh, Mele. Thank you very much, David. Um, we we'll have to be <clears throat> short after what David said. Um, but I'm sure that some of you are thinking that even if French speak always too much, that we not take too long to explain the place of American art at the Louvre. But um, do not cheer up too early. <laughs> David Brenneman and Sylvia Yount asked me to give you a report of the now two centuries long relationship between American art and the Louvre, plus some insights of the Louvre's exhibition the Terra and the Louvre, organized last year with the support of the Terra, and last, at last, the policy of the Louvre about American art. I will try to make it short. The relation between the Louvre and American art was a topic of the exhibition the Terra and the Louvre organized last year. Betsy Kennedy and I were the curator of this exhibition, and it has been an incredible success by the attendants, by the press reports, and by the fact that the exhibition has revealed an almost unknown aspect of the Louvre interest on American art and also the strong interest American artists always shared about the Louvre. The display, almost chronological, was mainly from John Bunderlin, Jean-Philippe uh, mentioned, to Thomas Hart Benton. The first, but the first painting showed in this exhibition has been painted even before the Declaration of Independence and the creation of the Louvre. Be sure that I'm not putting the two events on the same level. Um, this painting from 1769 by Henry Benbridge is representing Pascal Paoli, the Corsican leader who ruled the first and last democratic Corsican Republic during 10 years until this uh, very date, 1769. The painting now in the Paoli's 
birthplace museum in Corsica, in France, is very interesting as showing the strong links American artists at the very beginning always had with the Enlightenment spirit. I will not make a tour of the exhibition. There is still a catalog available in English. I would like to say that only, I would like to say only that since 1800, American art has been exhibited at the Louvre. This very year, John Vanderlyn exhibited portrait at the Salon. Two years later, later, Benjamin West came to show his death on a pale horse, now at the Detroit Museum. And there, he was greeted by Bonaparte himself in front of the painting. The year later, West was elected at the French Academy. Rembrandt Peel came in 1808, and after having painted Houdon and David, and David, sorry, uh, did the portrait of the Dominique Vivant de Nom, of Dominique Vivant de Nom, the director of the Louvre. Repeatedly, during the following decades, American artists came to France, and the Salon welcomed many paintings by them. In 1831, Morse came to Paris to paint his famous view of the Salon Carré. I will not say too much. Everybody here is more knowledgeable than I am on it. But I would stress the fact that it, its exhibition last year at this very same place, it has been created in the Salon Carré, has been a great event. Not only for the public who enjoyed the pleasure of a mise en abîme looking back and forth at the present room to the painting and his almost accurate vision of the past hanging, but also the Louvre's creator who saw this famous painting often for the first time. Thanks to that we were, sorry, I show you the <laughs> Thanks to that we were able to add some information of, on some paintings hang in the Moss um, painting. For example, a colleague of mine, Stéphane Loire, identified precisely the reputed Van Dyck in the top right, um, at the number 26, who is now attributed to Montfredi and is on deposit in original museum since the last century. Almost 15 years later, the Louvre has been almost literally occupied during some months by American art. One American artist and an Indian tribe with the astonishing Kathleen Gallery. George Kathleen arrived in France from England in 1845 with nine tons of material, his own paintings, but also Indian artifacts, which he displayed first in a private showroom in Paris. The King Louis Philippe, who spent almost a year in the United States when he was young, invited him to install this incredible display in the Louvre itself, in a very grand room, usually used as the meeting room for the Parliament. You can see here, draft by Kathleen itself, the display. It has been a very popular show, not only for the public, but also for artists like Delacroix, who did drawings from the Indians there. And Louis-Philippe commissioned, after that, 15 paintings from Kathleen, paintings that are still in the French public collection. The first commission has been, this first commission, has been the, Lou, the nucleus of the Louvre collection of American art. And I'm proud to say that this collection has been by far the best collection of American art outside the United States until 1986 only to remember you some nice pieces commissioned or bought by the museum during the 19th century and 20th century, I show you a not essential but interesting Whistler, the second purchase ever made by a museum to the artist in 1891. The painting was in the Louvre itself from 1926 to 1986, after having been at the Jeu de Paume. Again, in the collection of the Louvre was a quite nice Homer. And at the end of the 40s, 1940s, the national collections 
Musée du Louvre and Musée du Luxembourg and Musée du Jeu de Paume, the former institution for French and foreign contemporary art, were holding more than 200 American paintings and sculpture. During almost a century, American art has been probably the main field of interest of the French creator of, for, more, for foreign art. Why is this interest is now almost forgotten and invisible. It is mainly because of the split of the, of the collection. In 1977, opening of the, the opening of the Saint Pompi, at the opening of the Saint Pompidou, the new museum took the main part of this large American collection, but kept it in storage, considering often American art of the 10 and 30s as too traditional. In 1986, at the opening of the Musée d'Orsay, another large part of the collection were, was, has been taken. And that is now in the Musée d'Orsay that, that you can see the best uh, American art with the Whistler and the Homer I showed you um, just now. And during all this year, policy of deposit mainly in the Musée National de la Coopération Franco-Américaine at Blérancourt, where it's a national museum devoted to the Franco-American friendship, uh, received many, many other um, American painting and sculpture. And for example, the Kathleen's and all the sculpture from the 19th century are almost there. What is now left in the Louvre? Only three paintings. Two Gilbert Stuart, I show you one, and a Thomas Cole. Hundreds of drawings, that is a very good part of the collection, and no sculpture. And what could be a, an acquisition policy for the Louvre after that? When this question arose again some years ago with the new strengths, I thought that before making any purchase, it would be nice to have a more precise view of what we have in French public collection. Thanks to the Luce Foundation, and again, thanks to the Terra, I was able, with the help of, two team, of a team of two students, one from the Ecole du Louvre, Marie-Alice Sedou, and one from Yale, Gabriel Gopinat, to build a database on what we have in France. The results is more impressive than I thought, and we are still discovering new items every week. The database is available since six months uh, on the web, and it's very easy. You type Lafayette, American art, and that would be the first uh, on the ranks. Um, but we, we are still discovering every, uh, every week new things. For example, the last week, with the Sergeant Sorolla exhibition now in the Petit Palais, I discovered that the Petit Palais has six drawings by Sargent and um, a watercolor, not, in, in, not, still, not yet included in the Lafayette database. I'm sorry for this Lafayette title, uh, not very original but efficient. I'm trying to find for a British art equivalent database a title, and it is a nightmare. In our collective unconsciousness, we have almost only battle in common with the British. I tried last week to invent something like Waterlitz, combining Waterloo and Austerlitz. <laughs> but I realized that English were not in Austerlitz. And that the, bat the last battle we won against the British were almost unknown, and back so far in the past that it was embarrassing. Um, what is in the database? Um, almost, and what is in the national and public collection in France about British art? Only the database, almost 1,800 items with Elizabeth Noor's uh, paintings, Henry Osawatana, uh, which show you one later, Whistler, Homer, Thomas Hickins, Sergeant Kathleen, Walter Gay, Maurice Hunt, Marie Cassatt, Frederick McMoney's, uh, Bartlett, many other artists and very good, um, very good um, piece. The American works that exist in the collection display a remarkable vivacity and variety. The symbolist 
seascapes that Alexander Harrison gave to Auguste Rodin commemorate, for example, a reciprocal working relationship in which each artist introduced the other to sales opportunity, opportunities overseas. Some works are souvenir of the wartime alliance between France and the United States, such as Frederick McMoney's monumental memorial of the, de la Bataille de la Marne, completed in 1932, which was considered at the time to be America's answer to the Statue of Liberty. And there is, for example, an entire part of the John Storr studio, the, the uh, 20th century artist, in a very small museum in Maire near the Loire, or a collection of American painting in Etaples, where Tanner stayed during years. Well, I show you some um, slides of this um, Lafayette database with uh, pages about the collection, um, some pages about the, the entries, the first page for decorative art, for example, uh, and here another page. Here, the Osawa Tanner, for example, that is in the Musée d'Orsay. I'm sorry for the quality of the, um, of the image, but all the paintings or all the sculpture are not illustrated in the database where when the artists are too young or too recent, and Tanner, who died only in 37, was not available to be on the, on the, on the web because that, that cost too much. And that is the way to uh, use the, the database you type on the free text what you wish, and you will have the, the answers after that. And I show you, for example, the call, the, the, the file for the Thomas call we have in, in, uh, in the Louvre. We bought it in uh, 1975 for $2,000 um, from a French family. Um, and it's a very, very important Thomas Cole. It's the first Thomas Cole depicting the cross in the wilderness. Uh, and it was in the exhibition in New York in uh, 1845. And you can see we have um, comments, we have bibliography uh, in the database. A better image. Well, that is for Sylvia Yount. Um, when you type Cecilia Beau, and you will see many Cecilia Beau soon, uh, you can have two paintings described in the, in the database that are uh, at the Paris, at the Musée d'Orsay and in Blérancourt, and formerly in the Louvre. This survey of the American artworks that have accumulated um, in the French national collection reveals an impressive range, but there are also some puzzling gaps in the historical record. Notably, the Hudson River School is only represented by one painting by Thomas Cole. Um, I have to say that um, the national collection also do not include many artworks by significant figures like John Singleton Copley, Washington Alston, there is only two Benjamin West in Bordeaux, large sketches for the Royal Chapel on, in Windsor. After this survey, what could be our policy? The Terra, again, is helping us by giving advices and report on what we could buy, what could be the best policy. Probably taking account of our gaps on the chronological rule we have to keep our collection before the date of 1848, I think it's a very strange date, uh, indeed, corresponding only to a political event, but that is a rule. Um, we will try to build a collection of federal painting, mainly portrait by Copley, for example, and I would be very pleased to buy, to build, uh, and to buy too, uh, Hudson River School collection. My wish about the late would be to build a collection of sketches uh, by Church, Kensett, Heed, still not very expensive, but presenting very interesting links with French landscape. Um, it's a very interesting problematic between the two schools. Um, and I hope that the success of the exhibition last year will keep the interest for American art high, high as high that, uh, as the Louvre uh, showed uh, since two centuries. Well, thank you very much. ask
all the speakers to come up to the stage, please. I hope you're saving up your questions. Thank you, Olivier. I'd like to introduce uh, three additional scholars who are joining us today. And the first one, who is sitting next to Paul Stady, is Peter John Brown Brownlee. Find my notes, excuse me. Who is also with us today uh, through the good graces of the Terra Foundation? He is a postdoctoral, excuse me, curatorial, curatorial fellow for the Terra Foundation in American Art. I'm a mouthful where he's working with their curator, uh, Elizabeth Anderson, Betsy Anderson, on various collection-based projects, including one that is focused on the Morse painting uh, that deals with um, issues of uh, American artists, 19th century American artists, and their ideas of artistic theory and practice. So we're looking forward to what comes out of that. He has a PhD in American Studies from George Washington University, where he wrote a dissertation that he's currently turning into a manuscript, a book manuscript entitled The Economy of Eyes, Paint, Print, and Perception in Antebellum America. So we're glad PJ is here with us. Next to PJ is Akella Reason, who uh, some of you may recognize from her former days at the High Museum. She was a curatorial associate of mine in American art till uh, just very recently. Akella has her PhD in art history from the University of Maryland where she uh, produced a very interesting dissertation on Thomas Aikens. It was wonder, is there something new to be said about these major icons? And indeed, Akella had something new to say about Aikens and his, his ideas of history and uses of history in his paintings. Uh, she also is in the process of turning her dissertation into a manuscript, and she is also working uh, part-time at Georgia State, uh, lecturing at Georgia State. Um, Akella very uh, graciously offered to or agreed to step in today for Ann Abrams, Ann Yuri Abrams, who we had hoped was going to be with us. Ann, uh, you may know, is a, a wonderful independent scholar in Atlanta, an expert on Benjamin West, and I had hoped she could be here to talk a little bit about the Anglo-American dialogue that surrounds this painting and others at the time. But unfortunately, her husband is quite ill, so she was had to bow out um, of the panel. So glad Akella could, could be with us instead. Maria Ginthart, who is next to Akella, is another local friend, is a art history professor at Georgia State University, where she uh, specializes in 18th and 19th century European and American art occasionally. Um, another Penn alum, that's old home week for Paul, Mar Maria, and myself. Uh, she, Maria wrote a dissertation on that she is also turning into a book currently. And the title of the book, Manuscript, is Prehistory, Primitives, and Progress, Decorating Scientific Institutions in Fin de Siècle Paris. So Maria is our resident Europeanist today in terms of the, the 19th century context. So there's, there's so much to say. Uh, this is just such a fascinating painting, I think, as, as you've now seen. And I don't know if any of you, the docents in the audience, have had the experience of walking to the galleries with visitors. and and watching visitors get kind of a puzzled look on their face and not fully understanding first of what the painting is, uh, maybe why it's here, but particularly what is this painting by Samuel Morris? And we've heard so many different um, discussions about the, the primary meanings perhaps as well as the subtext of the picture. But I think just to start with that question, um, is it a history painting? Is it history painting? It's part, la part landscape inspired as we heard from Jean-Philippe, part panorama. I would say part genre picture. Um, Jean-Philippe again reminded us of the, the context in terms of the studio pictures, which was a very popular genre in both French and, and American painting. And I think to the, I wish we had more images to refer to, but the wonderful painting by Charles Wilson Peel that you may be familiar with, the artist in his museum. It's a museum picture as well. Um, but I want to just throw that out to the, to the panelists in terms of thinking about history and the ideas of history that really run throughout this picture, um, both art history as well as contemporary history, as we heard from Paul, and if anyone might want to speak to, to that notion in particular. Um, it's a very broad, broad question. I'm not trying to ask a pointed question, but just raise some, some issues. Paul? 
Well, it, it seems to me one of the things that it uh, lacks as a history painting is a moral lesson. Right. It, it's, uh, it, it is an instructive picture. It's didactic. It's to have a, 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 a lesson for its American audiences, but it, it, it's, it's uh, as Jean, uh, Jean-Philippe was uh, suggesting, it, 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 it's in the realm of communications, uh, the transmission, transmission of knowledge, but there's no real, there's no real moral lesson as a history painting should have exemplary human behavior, uh, selflessness, uh, being great in the field of battle or something, giving one's life up for one's country and that sort of thing. So it seems to lack that. And I know when I was writing about Morris, I, I was just so puzzled then about w- why he gravitated to 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 mm-hmm. um, this particular subject. But that would seem to be the greatest disconnect. It's got the size of a history painting. Right. Um, he certainly knows uh, about all of that, but it um, doesn't have, neither did the House of Representatives. Had, neither, neither did that have a moral base for such a hyper-moral artist. Does anyone have anything else to add to that? Oh. I Additionally, I would say, it, it, in addition to not having a, a moral lesson, it lacks drama, which is right. something that Vanderlyn also had a problem with with his Versailles panorama is that it was actually not a very successful painting for him in terms of sales and Too most static. panoramas had these very dramatic uh, sort of lively subjects and at least in his other history paintings, Vanderlyn said as he had the, the nude Ariadne at least to sort of attract attention but um, there's nothing like that in Morse's mm-hmm. uh, Gallery of the Louvre or House of Representatives paintings. Well, it's not a prurious painting, mm-hmm. but I think maybe you know, in, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, French-American stereotypes. Um, oh, good. There's, uh, <laughs> there's a wonderful product which I, when I first uh, saw it, I, I had difficulties imagining that it could exist, and it's something called I can't believe it's not butter. Mm. It's a <laughs> substitute for butter. And I would say uh, the, the painting mold is, is, is an I can't believe it's not a history painting. Um, in the sense that it has this, the size, sort of a part of the ambitions of a history painting, but it lacks butter, that is uh, history or drama. But. What's interesting is, I think, in a way, uh, Vanderlyn, as much as most, were trying to um, uh, do without butter in a very conscious way, uh, or maybe not totally conscious, but in a very uh, steady and um, uh, tenacious way. Um, They were against something very powerful, which was an audience that uh, only saw this as a negative, like something was missing. But I think, at least in their own practice, they were trying to uh, show something. Uh, and w- but with, within uh, extraordinarily uh, contradictory modes of uh, working. Well, in, in thinking also about this as a commercial picture that he clearly produced to be exhibited in that grand tradition of the great picture exhibitions, which certainly Benjamin West I would probably popular, popularized, we could say. And I just want to refer to um, Olivier actually wrote a wonderful essay for this catalog, which again is available in our shop, on um, really looking at the role of American artists' influence on French painters basically in the, not the full generation before, but a little bit earlier, and looking at the role specifically specifically of Benjamin West, who was considered the father of American painting, an American based in London most of his career, who actually did produce these history paintings that were full of drama and action and that excited a lot of attention, both from the literary world and in Europe. Um, Jane Austen uh, writes about uh, experiencing one of Benjamin West's paintings, and certainly Delacroix and Olivier mentioned that. So we know that there was a dialogue, at least at the outset. And is it David who mentioned that um, to Rembrandt Peels is the anecdote, why are all the good painters in London American? And he was referring at the time to West, to John Singleton Copley, to, or to Trumbull, to John Trumbull. Um, but in terms of this picture, it, it was never exhibited in Euro- Europe. Is that correct, Paul? Correct. He never had any intention of showing it to a European audience. So we don't know how 
Were there any European painters who wrote about this or responded to this? Just his American friends who came to visit him while he was painting? Right, no, not painting. that I know of. Not okay. Know of. Uh, when it was exhibited in New York, um, there were, of course, other things that could be seen. And, and um, one of them was a painting by an English artist by the name of Francis Danby. And it's a, it, was a, it still exists. I mean, it's a huge picture that shows a biblical apocalypse uh, the end of the world. That attracted a large audience. I mean, the lack of spectacle mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, why, why would John Q. New Yorker think that Mona Lisa, this large, um, is uh, a spectacle and, you know, come out, come out to see it? I mean, that would, I mean part, part of my question has always been, what was Morse thinking? <laughs> I mean, that this was going to take or that this was going to work. He knew perfectly well what things were, were like and where taste was located, but he somehow thought that this picture was going to be the, the instrument uh, to turn people's minds. No, and it wasn't. And I would just add, in the era before photography, I almost see this as a way of, it's like the slideshow you, or the digital slideshow today. First art historian. And it's like, that, you know, or when you think about your experience in the Louvre, it's usually beating back other people who are trying to take photographs of the Mona Lisa, so they only ever see it through their camera. And in some ways, this hmm. is almost bringing back a souvenir that he's interested in, picture, but that yeah. ultimately is boring the people he's showing it to. Well, and that's a question I always had. Was he, in fact, then painting it more for other artists? and patrons, because we know, you know, part of his European trip was financed by patrons who, who sent him to Europe to paint copies, in fact, of old master pictures. So he was doing this as a practice anyhow. Um, but there hasn't been much discussion of that. Well, Do we I think know in his, that? I think in his head, he's, he's, he's thinking about fellow artists. He's mm -hmm. thinking about uh, his pals in France. He's thinking about the professionals back at home. And yes, he, he, he's intending this to be a cultural, social, instrument, but in a, in a way he's living in his own rarefied world mm -hmm. uh, when he makes this. And he could have played it safe. He could have taken it back to the United States and put it on display at his very own National Academy That's of right. Design in New York. He could have restricted it to um, certain circles, literary artistic circles in America, and I'm sure everybody would have applauded him. But he took the, the, the dangerous, the audacious, the silly step of making it into a public exhibition where you pay uh, to get in. So once that happened, it was uh, in, in the world of popular entertainment. And it, it just couldn't, couldn't compete with some other, um, I'm not sure if I've got the right date here, but for instance, <coughs> the display of an Egyptian mummy in New York. I mean, Egyptian mummy, Gallery of the Louvre, <laughs> Egyptian mummy, Egyptian mummy. <clears throat> yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> Please, Dottie, would you come to the mic or? <laughs> Mike will come to you. I like, I'm a trained docent here 12 years at the high and very proud. Um, I like to educate through entertainment, and I get an entertainment value out of this Morse painting because look how much I can elucidate. First of all, I seduce patrons by saying, you want to see the Mona Lisa? She's in the back gallery, okay? <laughs> Once they're there, look at this, what we have, this panoramic. We can have the three-career Morse with his SOS. People don't believe it, you know. Then we have Fenimore Cooper, okay? Uh, with uh, the Pathfinder and the Last of the Mohegans, very Americana. Then we have, aha, uh -huh, an illusion that David Brenneman, sitting over there, said that, I think that's Diana mythology, one of the highest orders of art, second, third, sculpture. Spin, sculpture. There you go, all right. And, uh, and everything else that's in there. And, um, well, oh, I have one point to make to everybody in the audience, okay? I saw the Coast of Utopia at Lincoln Center, which is Tom Stoppard's new play. And in the, uh, the, it's a trilogy, in the parts one and two, they had two things. One is Delacroix's painting that you showed in the slide, and the second was the Manet, Luncheon on the Grass. And at both times, the audience stopped to applaud. 
if that's entertainment or education, I don't know, but what is it, Ars Brevita, Life's Longer, whatever. Well, I think, I think, that, I, you know, I, I think that, that's, a, that's a very good story. Thank you. I, I think that if we were to try to um, come up with a historical um, equivalent of, of what you're doing, because what, what you're doing, you're doing this at the high. And so, you know, imagine that instead of asking people, do you, do you want to see the Mona Lisa, that you ask that question at a local mall. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as someone's about ready to walk into Abercrombie and Fitch, and you're, you're saying, you know, but do you want to see the Mona Lisa? And, you know, I'd be, it'd be interested to have a video camera to get them. <laughs> I was also interested um, in thinking about some of the activities that um, are depicted in the painting that Jean-Philippe so eloquently spoke about and the ideas of communication and the transmission of knowledge. And I think we all will, will note that um, there are a lot of women in, depicted in this painting and we have a woman copyist, she's believed to be a copyist with Morse, her, pupil, her instructor, guiding her. She's painting the, uh, is it the Tintoretto that, that is here? And then the daughter of the Coopers, who in fact I think is holding a palette, it's hard to read, and a paintbrush, right? So she is actually painting. Um, the, the woman in the middle is holding a stylus, so she's sketching. And then this fascinating figure at right, which most visitors today I think have no idea what this woman is doing. Is she embroidering? I've gotten a lot of interesting questions. And in fact, she's um, a miniaturist, is that right? She's copying she is, at a reduced, so even smaller than what Morse has done. She is. Um, engaged in that process of reproduction. And then, of course, there is this uh, more prototypical romantic figure at left, the male artist, turbaned, possibly Greeno, is that right? This may be... No, Norman. Or this is the Georgia painter. Isn't this a painter who was thought to be from Georgia? This, pa oh, this figure Pam, here at left. Sham, I think his name was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But who is painting a landscape which, in fact, if you look carefully, is not depicted on that wall. So the notion that this is a painting that has come out of this artist, the true artist's imagination, he is not a copyist, he's not reproducing something that's hanging actually on the wall, but is inspired by what he's seeing uh, to produce his own original composition. So again, very interesting, I think, gender issues that run throughout this picture as well. Um, but to come to PJ a bit and thinking about the 19th century artists and, and how they did practice uh, their craft and that clearly old master copying was a fundamental basis for that. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, how this painting might have functioned on that level? And do we know, was this something that was held up as whether at the National Academy, Paul, students at the National Academy, was there a concerted attention given to that in terms of its, its tools as, as an artistic um, form of reproduction, I guess, and, and what one could learn from that process. Right, and I'm not sure, and I'm sure I have a, a, a clear answer to, to that. Uh, we, we, we're asking PJ. Well, I was curious about just the notion of theory. I mean, I guess I'm trying to get back to that, that idea of um, artistic practice and academic education and how this painting might have functioned, speaking to what you're exploring for your exhibition. Well, Morris talked a lot. <laughs> and um, he not only, this picture is in a way a piece of a larger, even larger uh, program because he started delivering these lectures on the fine arts. And um, this would be sort of uh, the, a digest of uh, accepted European art theory for American audiences. And he delivered this over and over and over and over again through the 1830s. And that was that was uh, one of the ways in which he, again, tried to carry his uh, message of improvement uh, to the public. His father, you should know, was a Calvinist minister. Mm -hmm. And preaching uh, came, moral responsibility as well as preaching came naturally uh, to him. And so this, this urge to get the message out. I'll pick up on that thread and talk um, for a moment about uh, I know in the scholarship on the painting, it has been said that Morse may have been one of the last adherents to the theories and discourses of Sir Joshua Reynolds. Mm -hmm. um, and I see this painting as working at, at that moment uh, that American art and, and visual culture may be turning away from that model to embrace other models. Um, to pick up on a few of the comments that Jean-Philippe uh, mentioned about 
uh, the painting's ordinary activity or, or, or the uh, ordinariness of its activities of writing and copying. I think you were talking about the House of Representatives. Um, like everyone up here and out in the audience, I would assume, we're interested in this painting for its peculiar, um, peculiar uh, failure or the way it sort of slips into the cracks between history painting and genre painting. Um, and I think it could be argued that it's maybe doing all of these things simultaneously. Um, what I'm struck by um, following Jean uh, Philippe's uh, points um, is that it is really um, an encapsulation of various new modes of, of representation of communication that um, become sort of the air and water uh, that the antebellum uh, Americans sort of swum in or, or moved in, uh, that it is so ordinary to think about um, writing and, and, and uh, printing and uh, mechanical reproduction, mm -hmm. even in, in its early phases in the 1830s um, and so forth, as being um, almost normal to the point at which this um, painting becomes um, almost boring to its viewer to sort of pick up on what's been said, uh, that it's not saying anything um, that you, you might not experience, you're not experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with reading a newspaper, for instance, or a few years later with looking at a daguerreotype or so on. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's uh, the, the, the activities that it depicts may be speaking on a level uh, under, uh, so under the radar of most of its viewers in the 1830s. Um, I'll leave it with mm -hmm. that. Yes. I mean, if you were, if you were uh, I mean, the telegraph follows right on the heels of this. Right. And he's thinking about it on his way back with this picture in the ship uh, crossing the Atlantic. So you can almost imagine this painting as uh, sort of dispatch from Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, so the telegraph message would go something like, I'm standing in the Salon Carré of the Louvre, <laughs> and I am now looking at, you know, and it's almost like these little communication bits, bites, uh, that are, 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 are being um, uh, transmitted uh, here. But unlike the other forms of communication, uh, the, the telegraph and the, 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 the and photography, uh, which was available to anybody. I mean, you could uh, mm -hmm. uh, learn it, you could do it. It's not that. Uh, painting, on the other hand, isn't something you can just, it's not a technology exactly, you can't exactly. Uh, pick it up, and so um, it doesn't have the democratic universal function uh, that uh, those other forms of communication have. So well, and, uh, you know, clearly it is a documentary painting in that sense, but it's also, it's very much an experiential painting too, I think, and mm -hmm. thinking back to Jean-Philippe's point about panoramas, and the scale is extraordinary. There's a sense that you can't take it all in at once, that you need to break it down, and I think he's doing that for us in a sense by visualizing these different figural groups and actually laying out the types of activities that you may yourself engage in if you walked into this gallery. Um, but, you know, that notion of, is that what people couldn't really relate to, that there wasn't any entry point for them? It wasn't just a narrative story. It was um, speaking, again, I, I guess keep coming back to who was the primary audience, and it was an, a painting for artists. Betsy Anderson, I think, points out in her essay in this book that, of course, for first, for most Americans, and this could be still the case today, our first experience of the Louvre is through reproduction, is through postcards or images that we see in our history books or tour guide books. And that part of that sense of awe that you feel when you walk into the Louvre today, of course, I should say, except for those lucky Georgians who were seeing paintings in the flesh for the first time here at the High, but seriously, when you walk into those galleries today, and the Grand Gallery especially, it's just that sense of you're just overwhelmed by the scale, by the color, the color and the scale, I guess, being the two key themes that um, American commentators noted at the time, you know, from the late 1800s on. Um, but that sense of the, ex the painting as experience, um, it's just more common. I guess I'm not sure where I'm going with that. <laughs> But seriously, were there discussions of that in the reception of the painting? Was there any discussion of, because I mean, are you getting your, your Panama argument, that's your own reading of the picture. You're not drawing that from, necessarily from critical reception at the time or? Um, no, there were, there were two, I mean, the, the quote I put in the title is, um, is by a reviewer of um, the House of Representatives 
in Charleston, if I'm not mistaken, in the Charleston Courier, and, um, and it says this painting is of a class somewhat novel, which right. in 1820-something, <laughs> I, I think it was right after, maybe 1823, mm -hmm. would include these the exhibition panorama. paintings with the idea that he's doing something else to it. Uh, so that might be an element. I just came across 10 days ago, uh, looking at notes, at uh, Morse's notes at the National Academy of Design, unpublished uh, notes. Um, there's a series of subjects in, um, that he lists for his lectures and Panorama is there. It's the oh, first mention I've seen of hmm. Panorama written by, by Morse. But it's there with caricature, um, oh. embellishment of paintings, which is a weird uh, entry, and some other stuff. So he, I was glad to see the world, um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. he never talked about it. I think he never talked about it because he didn't want to use the world because it was not you know, the higher branch of art. Right. So you could do the stuff, but not mention it. Uh, and maybe that would uh, do the trick. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe, uh, should I like to come back just a minute to the um, question of the audience? Yes. So I think we're, we may be a little harsh in our judgment, because it's easy to say now that it was going to fail. But for instance, um, Rembrandt Peel's Court of Death, which mm -hmm. made a lot of money, at the time, which has a slightly more spectacular painting, not as good as the, the End of the World by Dan B. But, um, <laughs> but in New York, for instance, the Court of Death didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. and, and my point here is that um, you know, in Hollywood, they spend a lot of time trying to figure out if a movie is going to be a blockbuster, and some of them are unlikely blockbusters, and some of them are unlikely failures. And I would like to um, make a comparison here. I think the audience was very unstable at the time. Mm -hmm. And you could try something, and maybe it would, uh, it would work. I think most was, it was rather unlikely, but it was not uh, um, necessarily totally um, In sync. Uh, impossible uh, thing to do. Um, well, and of course, there's a great tradition of American artists failing with their history paintings, John Trumbull's American historical subjects, um, and certainly the Pennsylvania Academy in Philadelphia. I mean, that was their goal for a while, to build an audience for history painting in America, to develop taste for it, because people didn't have the training or the background to understand it as much. So perhaps you're right. Why are we... Is it, it, I mean, obviously, it's not a Greco-Roman subject, though. It's not a historical subject. It's even more puzzling and would have been more puzzling to an audience. Um, I, speaking of history, though, I'd like to just bring uh, Maria in again. And I am curious about um, going back to ideas of artistic practice and copying and the uses of the old masters. What was the situation with the French artists in particular? Um, you were looking at those in your book, of course. Well, I would say that um, Morse is doing what French artists had been doing for years, and whether it was going to Rome, and you know, even in the 1830s, you're still having the Rome Prize competitions, and people are competing to get a chance to get scholarships to go to Rome to see Italian Renaissance art, mm -hmm. to see ancient art. But they're certainly haunting the Louvre to varying degrees, and that's what you do as an artist, is you look to the past and you copy. Mm -hmm. um, and I add a gender thing in a minute because you had mentioned that. Um, but even if you think, even someone like Manet, we've been talking mm -hmm. at the break, is many of his best known works, whether it's Olympia or Dijonet sur l'air, Luncheon on the Grass, he's taking old masters mm -hmm. and reworking them. People didn't recognize it at the time the right. way we do. But even, you know, if, if you see him as this major change, you know, Jean Finif ended with Corbet, but if you think Corbet and then what Manet does, mm -hmm. he's reworking those masters. Now, but with the gender, what I would say is, What's interesting is that women were, you know, we see women here, but for the most part, that's all they were really allowed to right. do. Right. And so that they it's, you know, it seems understand. like the women are so prominent, but there was this idea that women could imitate because mm -hmm. we had, you know, our, our intellect. Um, and of course, Larry Summers still believes that today. <laughs> um, luckily, Drew Faust, who has a pen background as well, will change right. things at Harvard. That's right. um, but th there's mm -hmm. the idea that women were perfectly capable of imitating and they were detail-oriented so they could do the miniature work, but it's the man who's mm -hmm. creating and being inspired because women weren't allowed to do that. 
But what I think is interesting is with the woman on the right is even in the late 19th century, which I'm more familiar with, um, many women were not painting outside the home because they said it was too much of a pain to get someone to be there as a chaperone. So I'm just really surprised That's, that she's yeah, allowed to she's be there by herself right. because in the 1830s that probably wouldn't have happened. And also that the Provençal, the French visitor who has a child but seems to not have a male companion it's with her, which is corner. interesting too. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a fiction, right? We know to a certain extent the painting is a fiction. Checking up on the uh, uh, Manet uh, mm -hmm. reworking of the old masters, maybe a question to the panel would be, um, it seems that, uh, and surely this work has been done, or at least begun, uh, perhaps the narrative of the painting is in the arrangement of the old masters. Mm -hmm. And I've mm -hmm. been sort of looking at it, and I don't have the background necessarily to begin to unpack that, but I wonder if, if there is some, if there is a code, so to speak, uh, yeah. to use a Morse metaphor, to mm -hmm. the arrangement of these works and, mm -hmm. and, and what kind of story are they telling? I know when I started to piece, pick out paintings and start to think mm -hmm. about sequence, I noticed all of the, uh, the entombment pictures of, of Christ or, or removing him from the cross and, and, and so forth. And um, that struck me in terms of um, Morse's um, religious Calvinist background and um, and so forth and so on. So uh, maybe turning us back to the, the works themselves and to credit Morse perhaps with sort of reinterpreting mm -hmm. not only the canon, but um, reinterpreting these works by placement and design and so forth. Olivier, do you have a comment about that in terms of, since you're so familiar with the paintings collections? Of the week? Yeah, well, um, Jean-Philippe showed uh, uh, a slide uh, representing the Salon Carré exactly at the right. same period. And, well, uh, Paul could, could say many, many more about that, but the, the choice most did uh, among the collection displayed uh, um, actually uh, on, on the, on the, on the no, actually um, at this moment uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the walls was very different. Mm -hmm. He did a very strong selection. He, in fact, there is almost no French painting. Right. Even, even old masters. There is Poussin and Claude Lorrain, but Poussin and Claude Lorrain were almost considered as Italian than mm -hmm. French, more, mm -hmm. more Italian than French. Right. And it, in fact, French painting is not at all part of the, of the, of the most taste. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so isn't there supposed to be a Vateau? I've never bought that argument, but here the far the, yeah. right yeah. Isle of Cythera. This size. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no. yeah. It's a choice too. Yeah. That could be a, a, a large that, that's Le Brun, or, that's mm -hmm. and and for example, there is something interesting is about uh, Spanish painting. For example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he, he chose uh, at least two Spanish painting, very prominent one is uh, the the little Murillo, and on the other side of the of the door there is this uh, um, other Murillo, and there was at this moment probably three, four, five painting by Spanish painters in the Louvre mm -hmm. in comparison with hundreds of French. Mm -hmm. Why choose that? Uh, we could understand about Murillo, the, the, this one, because it was a very famous painting, very sweet, very um, uh, attractive in a way. But why the other one? Mm -hmm. the, now the other one is the most important painting probably in the, in, the, in the Spanish collection of the Louvre, but at this period it was less known. The choice is very, very strange. And the fact that for, for, for a French point of view, to have, to have painted that was, at this period was very strange because all you make a picturesque painting showing what is exactly in the room, mm -hmm. or you make a course, or, or it's, it's a very, odd painting for French point of view because it's not corresponding to any standard of, Tradition. Um, mm -hmm. of we had many people who were making that. There is many paintings representing the Salon Carré, but usually they were, they were trying to be accurate, right. mm -hmm. or they were accurate. They were never trying to make a new display. And there, it was the same for the salon. There was, there was watercolors representing the, the hanging of the salon. But the more accurate it was, the more successful it was. That's and in this case, it's a, it's a very different, the, the, the uh, didactic uh, purpose of the painting 
was probably very odd for, for, for the French public. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason probably they, they were, not were not noticing it. Right. Along that line, I, I just had a sort of rhetorical question thinking about uh, the French painting of the Salon Carré that we're using as a comparison. And my thought was, as I saw it up on the screen, I wonder if the French painter's doing something similar to what Morse is doing. We, we take it, and it sounds like there, there's other extant evidence that this was a common practice. Uh, that accuracy was the goal uh, for the French painters in painting uh, galleries in the Louvre. But I wonder, I mean, in not, in not taking them at face value and think, to think about them as constructions as well. So was uh, the Jericho actually hanging in that right. gallery? Yeah, was, just, it, was it contemporary French painting for the most just part? Just sort of an <coughs> open-ended question. But hmm. Well, there is a painting we can compare with, with the most. It's a Zofani painting mm -hmm. of the <laughs> office. Right. Uh, where he, he arranged everything in the, in the room, but mm -hmm. the, the feeling is very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was no didactic no. purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, right yeah. well, I have, this is probably Alstady's field. Um, isn't there a preponderance of Venetian paintings which were advocated yeah. you know, as, a, as, a, as a great model by Morse's mentor, Washington also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of Venetian pictures. I mean, so those are understandable. Mm -hmm. But um, as Olivier points out, I, I, I thought about this for a while, but I, have, I never came up with anything. Mm -hmm. Why these? Why Murillo? And I always wonder about, you know, the Caravaggio. I mean, yeah, was Caravaggio really? wasn't thought to be a significant artist in yeah. 1830, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't quite understand that. And there, 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 just a, there are a number of them that are, I find somewhat um, baffling. I've never really been but I think you're right. There is some kind. There's got to be some kind of mm -hmm. code, which is the selection process, and uh, mm -hmm. and then there's the matter of placement because mm -hmm. there are those that, as in any kind of a hanging, those that are in the most privileged positions right. that you most uh, no notice most quickly, and those like mm -hmm. the plateau, that's <laughs> sort of right. off to the side, this large and at a s s steep angle, mm -hmm. uh, which which is almost incomprehensible to see. So there's there's that issue too. He's also changed some of the proportions of pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to, well, he's making a, it's a homegrown puzzle here. So he had to shrink some of the pieces and lar enlarge some of the others so that they would fit on the wall. So in other words, I think if you actually, there would be an experiment, get all these pictures from the Louvre and reinstall them here <laughs> in the Salon Carré. No you trouble. can ask. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, they wouldn't fit. I mean, you, you'd have spaces. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't, you couldn't really assemble it like he, he, he standardized the frames too. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah, they are. The, the frame, I wondered the frame, about the frames. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, they are. They're so simple. Yeah, they are the far more simple than they were mm -hmm. than they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, hmm. when you when you look at the Mayo painting, there is huge frame. Well, that took that take place to have huge frame in a, in a picture. He reduced almost all of them, and it's probably simpler to do. Mm -hmm. There was. Very, very. Uh, there is only two of three of them that are with curves, mm -hmm. yeah, and we could, we could, well, we could check, but it, it's, it, there is something else with that too. Mm -hmm. Any more comments from the well, panel before Paul we open? Well, as Paul has written, because I feel that we're also indebted to, yes. to Paul and his work. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was you that wrote uh, that. Uh, or even, I think, Morse writes it in his diary that he returns to America uh, after completing, say, 75% or, or more of mm -hmm. the painting and to do the, to, to uh, paint in the frames. So it is something that he does later. later. I mean, the, the question of the figures, when are they painted in as well, is mm -hmm. sort of intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one bit of evidence seemed to suggest that uh, they were all absent until he returned to the U U.S. And then it's also been pointed out, or I believe in... Um, Morse's own uh, guide or key to the painting, or his his short essay that he writes, um, he mentions figures in the painting. So that question lingers for me as well, mm -hmm. in terms of the, you know, how mm -hmm. he's uh, completing the painting and what mm -hmm. stages. Is, was that the case for the House of Republic uh, for Representatives? Excuse me, that was a slip, boy. House well, of Republicans. Well, that's not a um, <laughs> I didn't get into, but uh, in the House of Representatives, Morse's father is in the gallery with an mm. Indian chief who was visiting in Washington, and 
there's a reason for this, which is that his father had written a report for the government on Indian tribes. Um, but uh, here also the fact that these are his acquaintances here. Right, you know. they're friends. And that's not meant to be public sense that there's no key that tells you that this is Fannie Moore Cooper, etc. Mm -hmm. But it's not hidden uh, mm -hmm. either. And I was thinking about this when you were mentioning the question of why, the, why these pictures and in what arrangements. Because the placement, I think the choice is, uh, even though it's very Reynoldsian, um, it's like if you care about the British uh, late 18th century British theory of art, that's what you would mm -hmm. do, except over very interesting points that Spanish painting or Caravaggio are mm -hmm. in there. And that would, for me, that would definitely relate to Morse's, uh, I would quote, put this between quotes, but realist, pre-realist streak. Because mm -hmm. again, I'm really struck by the fact that this painting the next equivalents are in French painting in the 1860s, I would say. Um, with, and there was a wonderful exhibition two or three years ago in Paris and New York about um, Manet and Spanish Vesquez. painting. Mm -hmm. French painting right. and, 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 Vesquez, and Spanish yeah. painting, uh, mm -hmm. which was uh, a real eye-opener. Mm -hmm. um, and your remarks, so you just made me think again of this. Mm -hmm. and that, seems to strengthen the case. But about the placement of the paintings, if you look, um, well, the last painting near the lady with the weird headdress <laughs> um, is Tobias and the Angel. I think it's a Rembrandt painting, if my memory is good. And this was like a favorite of both Morse and Fanny Moore Cooper. Mm. And this is situated so he's in between, if you draw a horizontal line between the two, it's sort of right in the middle. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of, uh, a number of sort of private messages mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. that are not necessary for anything, but sort of embody the painter's experience in the painting, which I think is mm -hmm. a very interesting thing uh, also. And again, it's not a secret. If you don't know it, your knowledge of the, your enjoyment of the painting is not diminished. But it's the private public uh, but it's, tension. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's, mm -hmm. this is my experience, mm -hmm. and I show it to you. Um, and that maybe some other fellow artists would understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sort of, this is the sort of wink, wink. Mm -hmm. You know, you see what's going on here. You see, you know, my, my deep thoughts here, while the picture also is supposed to function mm -hmm. as a kind of reader's digest of, you know, masterworks in the loop. Are there any questions? I know we need to break it up. Uh, any other? Yes. Before this, I would like to return to this lady with the Normand mm -hmm. uh, lace uh, cap. And uh, when we read a painting as docent, <laughs> we have to read a painting before we can talk about it. I was wondering what this woman was doing there. And that meant that Morse either was a painter either expresses an emotion or he has a message. And I felt that Morse was probably, I assume, sending a message to this American audience that art was not necessarily for the very elegant and wealthy people, sure. but that also a peasant woman mm -hmm. could come and look at this art because obviously a wealthy or sophisticated woman would not wear this headgear to go mm -hmm. to uh, the Louvre was a public to, to museum. To go out of her, her, house, out mm -hmm. her village. So I think that perhaps, I may be way out to left field there, but perhaps Morse was sending us a message that art was not only for Paris or for Absolutely. Washington, mm -hmm. but also, and not only for the wealthy and the sophisticated, but for everybody, no matter where they lived. And that's why he was so disappointed Mm -hmm. when he failed mm -hmm. and joined the club and became mercenary. <laughs> and then the question I had for Monsieur Maillet is that a few years ago in Paris, there was a superb exhibit of the American artist at the World Fair of, of 1900. Yes, 
mm -hmm. uh, 2000, no, 1900. 1900. And it was amazing. It was superb. And I, when after I saw it, I said, this should go also to the United States to be exhibited. It was. It was organized by American Museum and had one Paris venue. But Where was it? Mm -hmm. I, well, anyway, I had it seen it. It came to my old museum, actually. The first thing that came to my mind is that it should be seen also in this country. Yeah. It was, yeah. That's all. Thank you, Regine. Any other questions? Howard? What, what was the step through before mm -hmm. the terror question. acquired it? And from the time it left Morse. Steps. <laughs> Morse had it in his possession. He displays it. It doesn't do that well. Then he offers it for sale, and he sells it to a um, man from upstate, upstate New York, George Hyde Clark, um, who, and it stays in that family connection. I assume this is a, uh, it stays in that family connect, uh, collection for a long while. And then it's eventually bequeathed to Syracuse University. And it was there for quite a while, and um, they sold it because I don't think they have a, an established museum there, so it um, it didn't quite fit into the uh, and 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 Tara bought it. Dan Tara bought it. The ambassador, ambassador Dan Tara, Tara, which is very right. interesting too to think about his his attraction to this picture. And... Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our panelists, our speakers. Wonderful program. Thank 